Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you very much. You've had a busy trip to Washington, D.C. from India. Absolutely. Tell us what brings you to Washington. Well, we, uh, as a political party, we thought we must reach out and let people know that we are also in the business of promoting trade and investment and strengthen the relationship between the two countries. So over a period of time, India and U.S. have been very close to each other, but we need um, political support and people like us coming here to understand better practices in government and also to get some important takeaways that we can go back and implement back in our country. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, two-day trip to Washington, D.C. We met with a lot of um, senators and congressmen and, of course, um, the Secretary of uh, Housing. Some of the points that we discussed really impressed us because as a young political party, uh, we have to build a vision and uh, something for the future. And the takeaways were excellent in our opinion, and this is something that's going to help our country and our people. Let me ask you, uh, we have listeners who probably are wondering, why should America care about what's happening in India and, and have stronger relations? Uh -huh. So what message would you give to them? You have to understand, uh, uh, the world pop one sixth is the world population is in India. So what happened? India is the largest democracy. What happens in India? Eventually, it will reflect back in the other parts of the world. So you cannot ignore what's happening in India. It's very much. Uh, it's a quite essential for the rest of the world to uh, know about it. And eventually, it will influence. If some issue happens out there, here you can say the great workforce of Indians are there. So eventually, it will hit the economy in very crucial sectors of uh, uh, business here. So you mentioned trade as one. I know security is another relationship that's important between the United States and India. What other things would you like to see the two countries work more collaboratively together on? You know, all around the world right now, the biggest thing is employment, right? So, you know, India has always supported the, the drive for technology and in innovation in uh, America. A lot of our young engineers have been coming here. They've contributed their time and effort into making some of the successful technology programs and missions out here. So I think we also need to focus on agriculture because that's the biggest employer back in India. And some of the best practices, the good technology that this country has been uh, building upon is something that we can draw upon and take it back to India and see if we can implement those. The new areas of uh, business, which is very really keen for a growing nation like India, is clean energy, waste management, and of course, on the security uh, side, uh, we had to deal with uh, terrorism like USA also had to deal with uh, that issue. And we have collaborated very well on several um, specific programs, but I think uh, the government of India and the government of America have come forward to sign agreements which enable the transfer of such technology, which earlier would be given only to NATO countries. So India is uh, the third country after Japan and Korea in Asia to get that benefit, uh, where sensitive technology which was available for security purposes is now being uh, transferred to India. Mr. Kalyan, can you tell us about the journey from being an Indian filmmaker and producer and actor to now a political leader? Um, it maybe, uh, first of all, I never thought of uh, to become an actor, so Disney pushed me to become an actor. But my heart was always uh, uh, looking towards to work for my country. I don't know, I never knew which way to go. But I think eventually it, uh, uh, the path led to get into politics. And the reason was, it's about the public policies, uh, if it is affecting uh, common citizens. And we are, I'm not able to, I was, I was just being a helpless guy, or being an armchair thinker, or armchair activist. And I was sick and tired of it constantly. That inner dialogue is uh, killing. Uh, it was killing. Uh, one, to one point, it was driving me mad. Either you do, you do it. I sit at home and do films, but I could not uh, keep quiet. So to answer to answer my conscience, I've taken a call, just plunged into politics. And how would you describe the mission of the party that you started? It's about India is a very complex country. Uh, it's, we don't speak one language. We are not of. Uh, one ethnic group. We are uh, hundreds of ethnic groups and we have uh, uh, hundreds of dialects and we, have, we are close to have around 30, 40 uh, languages, uh, different languages and different dialects. Um, we have a lot of cultural clashes. 
So all these things put together, we have to really steer India and somehow the destiny is, uh, we find something commonality amidst all these contrasting uh, uh, issues here. And that's what uh, interests us and that's what we want to bond it further. Because if you don't work, it, work towards it, and there are a lot of uh, issues would uh, crop up in the decades to come. And as a part of our journey, as a part of our commitment, so we brought all this, uh, we brought all this, on, uh, now all people ignore it. Because why a particular issue has to arise and the states might get divided into further into smaller fra fragments, segment. Uh, so we want to make sure, so we brought all this into one fold into the seven principles and to unify, because you don't, uh, I don't know how much you have an idea about India. We, I don't know, the rest of the world does not have it. We have a caste system and we have a religion, we have a regional issues. So we brought everything in together and also this is one principle we brought into the party uh, for it to bind India. And the second would be predominant, I mean, development with uh, ecological awareness. So this is the main core uh, which we are looking forward to. This is the fundamental which the party was formed. Just to, just to add to what he said, I mean, you know, uh, most of his followers in the movies were the, the young people of India. And, you know, he reflects their aspirations earlier in the movies. So the same thing he had to continue in politics to make them feel uh, confident that there is a person out there who is thinking about us. And he reflects the aspirations of that segment of the population which is very keen uh, to have a different India uh, in terms of opportunities, in terms of uh, more broad-mindedness, cutting aside, you know, regional disparities, uh, going to become a global citizen and as part of that outreach program is what brought us to Washington DC. That's wonderful and and you know just for so our listeners know I've heard you described as the Tom Cruise or the Denzel Washington of, of India filmmaking. Uh, of course those are two popular American actors. You also mentioned that it, if I understood you correctly that your path into acting uh, wasn't something that you planned out. So how have you uh, been able to? Uh, oh, because I, I don't know me right from a childhood. Vic, I came from a very small family. My father was a government employee in the police services. Um, Max, my family was looking me uh, looking at me to become a uh, uh, into police services. So somehow I could not finish my degree, and uh, I was uh, into a lot of yoga and a lot of uh, spiritual, my mind was going towards the spiritual realm. Uh, so I was learning, uh, I was into a lot of yogic practices. I think my family was quite uh, uh, irritated about that. And I said, you're growing and you're not doing anything. And I said, I don't know what to do. Then I said, why don't you try acting? Then I said, okay, I'll try, let me try. Because my family is in uh, uh, film business. So I just tried and someone liked it and that's how it started off. Um, but whatever I do, I'll, I'll be, I put my focus completely into it, onto it. that's how it went on. That's great. Well, congratulations on the success that you've had. Well, we touched on this a bit, but what are some ways that America and India can better partner together? Excellent. I mean, you know, like I said, India is still a country which is very open to having a very strong relationship with America in terms of trade. And also the fact that most of our young people have a desire and a vision to come and contribute in the universities here as well as the technology areas. But the newer areas of uh, uh, opportunities in India are really going quicker. And uh, mobile communications, um, space technology, like I said about agriculture, and not to forget, you know, waste management and clean energy are some technical areas where uh, America has already advanced itself and we'd be happy to collaborate and, you know, get in people who'll be able to invest into new products and new factories back in India. So I think that, I think these are a broad areas where we can collaborate. We've done in aerospace. We've also done in uh, infrastructure like ports. So, uh, you know, the opportunities are plenty. And, you know, we are, like I said, it's a, it's, it's a very democratic nation, which is not regulatory as it used to be, and very open and broad-minded in terms of doing business with America. So many of those areas that you mentioned, of course, are core to the free enterprise system that, that both of our countries deeply believe in. Can you talk at all, given the size of the population of India, how that belief in free enterprise and freedom more broadly has lifted people out of poverty and helped them uh, to better lives? 
you'll be surprised to know that India has a population of a billion today. And, you know, both our nations are indeed blessed to be so democratic in their uh, systems. Uh, there's a lot of transparency. Uh, there's a lot of equality, freedom. This is something that we cherish. This is what the Constitution gave us. And all our citizens work hard towards uh, building up their families and the ecosystem around them. So I think the opportunities are there, but the relationship has to improve even more. We are, we are beyond a stage where we think of you know local area domination or wars or uh, situations which used to exist in the 1960s or 70s. Uh, strategically, a partnership is very important between India and America in, in the Asia Pacific region. And um, it, it, it's, it's incredibly rewarding for both of our countries to come together and push this partnership <coughs> further. You know, at a time when President Trump and China are going back and forth <coughs> an issue of trade, uh, can, can you share how uh, we hear all of the contentious nature of what that relationship is? Uh, how is President Trump viewed in India and in terms of relations with this White House in particular? Uh, let me see. Uh, see, what uh, the way uh, Donald Trump is viewed in India is like, I think he is, whatever he's doing, he's doing it for his country. Though it will hurt the interests of Indians, or it will hurt the interests of other nations. Uh, but what he's doing is it definitely it's good for the U.S. That's how we look at it. Because that identity politics is uh, quite high on, uh, it could be seen everywhere. Right from Catalonia, or from Brexit, or anywhere, in all the countries we go. And even within India, that identity of, you know, uh, some people who come all the way from other, other places and they're able to get the benefits be better than us and they're able to progress better than us, prosper better than us. And I think definitely that anger is quite common in uh, all over the world. Uh, I think uh, Donald Trump is representing uh, that part here. So, though it, it pains, definitely it pains. There is no doubt about it. But a part will understand. So, it is a kind of contradictory uh, issue there. Interesting. Well, you know, one area where, where Trump has uh, done things differently, perhaps from some of his predecessors, is his use of social media, particularly Twitter, to talk directly to the uh, American people and, and people across the globe, frankly. I wanted to ask, because I just saw a report this week about how India could be <coughs> really the next significant area of growth for, for social media companies and technology. Uh, what can you tell us about the, the use of those platforms and how that's changed communication back um, in your country? No, no, no. no. <coughs> Uh, he initiated uh, his brainchild is recently um, from a party side. Uh, he thought he uh, initiated a program. Uh, it's called Janata Rangam. It's a wave of people. That's the meaning of it. Uh, so how it went, so I think you'd uh, better to explain it. So before I get into that, I mean you must know that he's the sixth most popular guy on Twitter. Uh, you know he's got close to three and a half million followers. And he's actively followed. And what's uh, the handle for our <laughs> listeners in case they want to <laughs> check uh, it's, it out? It's, it's Pawan Kalyan. At Pawan Kalyan. At Pawan Kalyan. Uh, and um, this program that he just mentioned about the, um, in, in the party, we started a program called Janatharangam, which is waves, acoustic waves, as well as waves, reaching out to people. And it was a knock on every door political campaign. But interestingly, we used technology. And all those knocks on the doors were on Facebook Live. So on a particular day, the president of our party, Mr. Pawan Kalyan, also visited the houses at 9.30 in the morning. And, you know, this conversation that went live uh, made people join this incredible revolution back there. And we had almost 30,000 videos on Facebook every day for five days. 30,000. And our social media reach uh, figures was just mind-boggling. We did 12 million in five days. And we had 396,000 people who uploaded the videos. So, so it, it was a tremendous... Uh, and, uh, and people are really, because this uh, technology really we're making people to participate and they're able to be you know, local or verbal about uh, what, they, what they feel. And uh, both the party ideology and, and everything, and we're able to leverage uh, social media in, a, in quite an effective manner. See, the biggest, um, uh, I wouldn't say the biggest, but our core strength is the youth who, who follow him and believe his ideology and his fundamental beliefs or values in life. And those are the ones who wanted to express their support to the party in the right way. And, and social media gave an opportunity for each of them to be part of that process because as a political party, we may not be able to reach out to every single person. 
uh, even if we did, we could not have given them an opportunity to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. But social media allows each one of them to connect with him. So and end of the evening, he would sit down and make phone calls to you know whoever performed <laughs> uh, beyond a normal figure, like 200, 300 uh, calls per day these guys would take and he would call them and congratulate them. So, so it, was great. it broke all the protocols, I mean the regular pro pro political protocols, so which made them uh, to be more straightly connected to, me, uh, to us. So that gave us a, a lot of leverage. Uh, and I think uh, social media is going to be very powerful. That's really inspiring, yes. And you make a great point about social media allowing participation. Mm -hmm. I know the youth probably certainly really enjoy that. Are there any final messages you'd like to share with our listeners before we go? You know, I, like I said, this partnership is very important for both the countries. And we are here as a young political party to also continue the same friendship and partnership. And we're also here to represent our community because most of the community members today are feeling a little, uh, I wouldn't say upset, but uh, a little sad at the at the new administration, the new regulatory controls that came in about immigration and how their families and their children could get affected, especially on the H-1B visa regulations that have come in. So we are here to uh, support our community, give them that strength and confidence. At the same time, at the government level, we are here to make the lawmakers understand that this is a process that they also must respect and take it further. So from my side, I would like to say, a lot of uh, cultural understanding should get deepened between U.S. and uh, India, because uh, uh, we call it as uh, because uh, America is, is discovered just to they want to go to India, but instead of India, they discovered America, Columbus. So there is some connect uh, right from uh, the discovery of America. I, a lot of us feel that uh, there should be a lot of uh, cultural exchange programs uh, is very needed before even to understand before business to hit take it to the next level I think a lot of uh, uh, cross-cultural understanding between uh, America and uh, India because each uh, part of India has a very unique culture so you cannot say India is uh, one culture because it's, it's a multiculturalism to understand that I think each state should have a, uh, have a direct connect with the US so to understand to explore their own culture and so America will have uh, at least minimum at least 30 to 40 uh, cultural exchanges and that would really deeply enrich the uh, prospects. In our own experience I mean when we talked with lawmakers in the last two days the ones who had been to India were able to empathize and get on the subject real quick but the ones who have never been to India would take time to understand the points that we were coming to so it makes a great difference I mean once mm, you know, we have this exchange programs on a regular basis and people understand our nation and the culture, uh, I think it will be significantly better. Well, it sounds like a good uh, project for the Daily Signal. Maybe Ginny and I can pay a visit to you in India. I know my colleagues from the Heritage Foundation have already. So. We will look forward to India, that. India really, <coughs> India really shocks you because there is a great wealth and there is a great poverty. At the same time, uh, people don't complain and somehow they are able to withstand the pain and the tolerance is quite high. And still, they don't want your good. They want their own good. And that's what India talks about. And even when Martin Luther King Jr., when he came to uh, India, that's what he expressed. If the same situation would be prevailing in any other country, it would have led to a, a bloody war. And how come it does not happen in India? I think that's what uh, anyone can learn from India. Amidst all these disparities, how people are still able to smile and go on with their life uh, without a bitter bitterness on their face and without a single complaint. I think that part, if you understand the, understand the soul of India, it's very easy to, do, to deepen the relationships. That's what I'd like to know. Well, thanks to both of you for coming and spending time with The Daily Signal, sharing your story, and uh, to our listeners, I encourage you to check out uh, the work that they're doing, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll continue to follow it. Yeah, thank you both for uh, letting us uh, participate in this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and I hope you reach out to India in your podcast too, and we'll be happy to support that. And we'll make sure it'll go. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Indians will reach out to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.